Good afternoon. Thank you so much for asking me to come and speak at this inauguration event. What I'd like to do is give you a personal view of what I think are the opportunities and challenges to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to transform medicine. I think it's a hard problem. And I think it's worth reflecting on where we are now and perhaps the successes that have been made. We hear a lot about it, but also what the longer term challenges are and why they are so difficult. So I think it's fair to say at the moment that the catchphrase for our current environment would be anything you can do, AI can do better. And so, for example, you know, if we take digital images from radiology, pathology or retinal scans, and we ask what does the radiologist, the pathologist or the ophthalmologist see, we can learn from that and algorithmically do better at seeing patterns and identifying signal from noise um, in these digital resources. And it's done well. We also benefit from the ability to join disparate data sets that are actually quite difficult to join using standard methodologies. And you know, classically would be clinical data, a rich clinical medical record joined to an imaging data set and looking for key data items in that data set that allow us to interpret and understand data better. Uh, and the sort of work uh, that the Van der Schaar lab has done in understanding cystic fibrosis and so looking at what information is hidden inside these complex data sets that allow us better to classify individual conditions. The same is true of molecular and genomic information and its counterpart with pathology imaging. You couldn't have a better example of total artifact than histopathology. Uh, I am a histopathologist and I've spent a long time looking down microscopes at the images of pathology sections. But it's important to remember that they bear only a vague resemblance to normal biology. The tissue is fixed in formalin. It is stained with dyes uh, that are used from the uh, um, chemical industry, um, picked up by acids and bases. Uh, so that you know, the acids of nucleic acids stain blue and you learn and are taught to recognize it patterns uh, much as you would do matching wallpaper. There has been a lot of work, of course, over many years in correlating those patterns with underlying disease, but it is still a correlation between the two. And as we're seeing now, actually some of the histopathological features that we recognize are associated with underlying molecular defects. And that's potentially of value. I think AI is also being of value in addressing some of the limitations of statistics. Statistics has huge power, but its power is based around large data sets, normal distributions, uh, and uh, rich, uh, high value uh, data sets, which when you're interested in individual patients and smaller data sets with missy and messy, missing and messy data, that becomes much, much more challenging. And so um, artificial intelligence machine learning can do very well now. And in the last month or so, we've seen uh, advanced machine learning pick off a well-defined problem that was championed in the press as being a problem that was unsolved for 50 years of protein folding, uh, where AlphaFold was able to better predict and better identify complex protein folding. I think the beauty of that is that, of course, the problem was very, very well defined. And one of the biggest challenges in medicine is actually the problem definition stage. So while there are huge successes uh, in machine learning, there are considerable challenges. And so, as you'll see in the image of the left, uh, what I've picked off is what I've called a, a state-of-the-art tool from two and a half to 3,000 years ago, uh, which I'm sure at the time was seen as quite revolutionary, but perhaps we'd want something different now. So the real challenges of medicine, I think are much more complex. And it's important to realize how artifactual medicine really is. 
Now, you know, we've shown on the shown on the left someone pulling a set of traditional medical notes, and and everyone will say, well, of course, now we have electronic medical records. Yes, they're easier to search. The data in them is electronic; it can be pulled at scale and at speed. But actually, the problem is the underlying nature of medicine, that we're still describing, for example, a lump as being hard, firm, and soft. Now, that is very quantified because when I was taught how to do it, hard is what your forehead feels like, firm is what your nose feels like, and soft is your lips. So at least we can all agree on that. In the same way, diseases can be chronic or acute. Now, it, it, that may be chronic in duration and acute in presentation, but they can also be the pathological features of a disease, of whether it's rich in uh, neutrophils or rich in uh, lymphocytes. And you know, common you know, giant cell and various other descriptions of disease are used to subclassify. I've already talked about the classification of histopathological images based on patterns you know, with breast cancers that can be cribriform, papillary, tubular, a range of relatively crudely assessed metrics of mitotic rates, cells in turnover cycles. All of these contribute to what we see perhaps as the science of medicine, but are highly subjective and really more of an art. And finally, you know, illnesses progress from being mild, moderate or severe. And so behind all of this is a trained convention in how we learn to combine symptoms and signs and investigations to make a diagnosis and to track disease. We also want to follow disease over time and longitudinality, which I'll come back to, is so fundamental to our understanding of medicine both from the sort of ground state that we inherit in our genome and environment through to exposures and durations of exposures and the order of events and competing events that actually being able to diagnose a condition and follow it and quantify that is a hugely complex process. We have well-defined quantification processes, for example, the stage of cancer or dysplasia in cervical cytology but they are very much a collection of rather crude features that don't necessarily reflect significantly underlying pathology or the pathological process, but may obviously be correlated with how we treat um, and you know, outcomes. But again, it's largely empirical. Um, in the same way as treatments and interventions are very much clinician dependent, empirical, and uh, as again, the Van der Schaar group has spent a long time looking at treatment effects, counterfactuals we don't have at an individual patient level. And then there are other challenges, simply the availability of data, the vast number of confounders that are in the system. So where I think the real opportunity for us is to look at what I've called longitudinality, association and causality. What's shown on the screen here is a timeline taken from an individual cancer patient by pulling together all of the cancer data that we've got on individual patients. And we've done this across England for all cancer patients. And we have data going back now to 1998 of all of the series of events of those patients linked from a whole range of sources, linked to their cancer diagnosis, linked to accurate staging of that cancer diagnosis, we have their chemotherapy, their radiotherapy, individual uh, doses of chemotherapy. So we have a very, very rich longitudinal data set, which allows us to drill in data, how long someone's been in hospital, the admitted patient episodes, how, how they presented in an emergency, the various other specialties uh, that they have attended, um, the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, outpatient events, emergency admissions, primary care medication, secondary care medication, all of this produces a very rich data set uh, on individual patients. And we have this for many hundreds, many thousands of patients, and we can begin to pull this data together. And what you see here is simply a stacked bar chart of individual patients where each column here, and they're over 9,500 patients here, shows their process through pathology, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and other events. And what we've done is used this at a patient level to look at predictive analytics um, of can we show what the outcomes of those individual patients are and the risk prognosis at an individual patient level 
comparing what we've done with traditional statistical techniques, such as the model that uh, I developed with Paul Farrow uh, and more recently with David Spiegelhauter, which is the PREDICT models uh, for the outcome of, of cancer patients with breast cancer. So working with Dan Jarrett uh, in Mihaela's group, we built this uh, predictor, which takes individual patient level data and allows us to understand the longitudinality of individual patients. And we can put in the individual data on an individual patient, uh, for example, their age at diagnosis, the tumor size, the uh, receptor status positivity uh, for the breast cancer, the stage at diagnosis, and use this data in the same way as PREDICT does, but actually using a machine learning model to work out mortality risk over time. Uh, and this then allows us, though, to drill down to individual feature level importance so that we can begin to see how each data point is calculated and what the key components of the data at an individual person level is used to calculate that data point. And again, this degree of analysis and interpretation of individual data points is essential if we're going to begin to get the trust and transparency that we need into machine learning models so that we can begin to understand how these calculations are made and whether they make clinical sense. What we can also do, though, is because we're interested in longitudinality, we can begin to follow the patient over time. And we have this event-based model where more and more data is being collected over time. And so we can recalculate the risk and revisit the historic risk uh, as the patient progresses. So down here on the right, we have a collection of events that have taken place since we made the initial diagnosis on this patient, for example, um, chemotherapy treatment, radiotherapy, surgery, uh, chemotherapy cycles, hormone treatment, can all be refactored into the model to recalculate the risk and plot the risk over time. And so 30 months later, we can then look at all of those events and recalculate both the historical uh, one-year risk that is now accurately calculated using real data and the new updated predicted risk and understand which of these events have contributed to those uh, individual predictive points. And one can drill in deeper then to understand why you may get an artifact here and what particular prediction, uh, a data item in the prediction led to this particular blip uh, at about 16 months. But what I really want to be able to do is to be able not just to give a risk prediction, but to be able to look at patients being treated to the system and ask what is going to happen to this patient in the future and what events will determine whether a patient needs to be treated differently. So can we cluster patients into individual groups and then identify the key features that suggest that a patient should now be treated differently? So when does a patient flip uh, based on their outcomes? So we've been doing a piece of work that's just been published on looking at the sort of deep temporal phenotyping of patients against disease progression. So we can look at what outcomes are doing, such as recurrence or death, and say, OK, at this point, we can group these patients in a particular way that will say we expect this group of patients to have this particular outcome in this particular time. But as our data continues, so we want to be able to identify over time whether that patient needs to be switched into a different group. Because one of the biggest challenges is not just to set out and treat a patient in a particular way for the rest of their life, but to understand the key events that are taking place in their treatment that would suggest that they should be treated differently. And how do we flag those patients and understand that jump from one group of, of treatment to another. And this is where, you know, the application of machine learning to individual phenotypes over time is crucial. But it's hard. And I think what is worth reflecting on is why longitudinal analysis is so difficult and why we're really at the start of longitudinal analysis and that understanding longitudinality is crucial to understanding medicine. So down the bottom here is this iconic sort of view of a patient pathway with cancer. But let's actually consider what it might look like with the underlying pathology. So the pathology that a patient has, maybe that's a cancer where the mutation has taken place at this uh, time zero, the tumor begins to grow. 
or maybe this is poor blood glucose control. We're beginning to get the early stages of diabetes or the early stages of hypertension. But at this point, we know nothing about the patient. They haven't presented they're without symptoms, but the disease is already there. It's only at some crucial point that a diagnosis is made, maybe uh, by chance, maybe because of some symptomatology, maybe because of screening. And the position of this condition diagnosed is very much dependent on what diagnostic techniques we've got to make it. So as we get better, perhaps, at molecular diagnosis from circulating DNA or other tests, such as the GRAIL test for cancer, so this diagnosis of the condition will move earlier. But the patient already had the pathology earlier. So the manifestations, the underlying uh, uh, interpretation of that data, it isn't good enough just to know that the patient has pathology at the time of diagnosis. We need to have some view as to what is happening prior to diagnosis. But having diagnosed the condition, we then may start medication. And medication is very nice in our time series because we know exactly when it starts. The problem is we don't really understand the dose. So we see the dose go up, the dose may come down, it may plateau as we reach a steady state. And so the dose, we can begin to map a patient. We know when the medication started. and We have an idea of the continuity of the dose of that patient over time. But what may happen in time is the condition worsens and we decide to add in another medication. Good, a nice timed event, which we can be very certain of. True, we may wish to consider counterfactuals of medication we might not have used. Um, but as we start this new medication, so we end up with a complication, which we end up with side effects. So we have to stop the first medication. The medication doesn't stop instantly. And again, the complications of that side effects or the duration of the medication here may well have long-term sequelae. Um, for example, you know, giving antibiotics such as gentamicin for a long period of time may damage kidneys and the ear. Um, so there are consequences of long-term exposure to therapies, which again need to be factored in in this longitudinal model. But the condition, it's, this is not good enough just to have one model for one group of patients, because of course there are variants in patients. So in the background, we may have a population that are either perhaps fast or slow acetylators who are metabolizing their medication differently, all of whom, again, are in this mix and need to be taken into account. And finally, we might have a group of patients where the pathology is completely different. You know, they may have a, a genetic predisposition. It may be a much more aggressive disease. And so this complexity of medicine in the background is something that we need to try and capture to understand if we're really going to apply complex AI to longitudinal disease trajectories um, and understand the association uh, and causality of one condition, or one observation with another. So I think this is the real challenge uh, for the Center for AI and Medicine. It is bringing together this multidisciplinary team it very much builds on the work of Michaela's lab already. And I think one of the fundamental things that's going on at the moment is the revolutionizing healthcare series, which is really working very hard with clinicians to turn medicine from this art into a science. And it's only by doing this that we'll be able to create good, rigorous formalisms that allow us mathematically to capture what medicine is. But there's a real challenge for us at the clinical end to be able to put aside the highly subjective components of medicine and try and understand where we can produce accurate scientific assessments of what is happening clinically. And I think that is one of the most significant challenges for making this step forward. Once we have the formalisms, we can produce potential solutions which can be calibrated and evaluated. And I think the future is that the Center for AI will take us down that pathway and allow us to do real tests of this type of environment in a clinical setting with partners and pushing back into the basic underlying processes of disease and out sideways um, into how these can be applied in clinical trials and the complex real world that the pharma partners are involved in. Ultimately, though, even if we have this cascade, we still need underlying that, the ability to have transparency, interpretability, and trustability. And so the ability to understand the models that are behind this is also crucial. So I think there is a future. It does take us from the tools that we saw and we're using now, which you know, look impressive, but are essentially those of the Neolithic AI community into what I hope 
will fairly shortly be the advanced AI community where we have a whole range of different tools with different functions, different processes for doing all of these remarkable things. The Centre for AI in Medicine in Cambridge, I think, gives us that opportunity. Thank you so much for asking me to speak.